Shalom, shalom, everybody. Good morning, Grand Rising. Uh, Peace be unto you, everyone who is listening in today. Uh, It's your sister, Shia, back with another uh, story time session, continuing from yesterday, um, The Great Cosmic Mother. We are currently in the chapter, The Mother of Wild Animals and the Dance. And I'm going to jump right in. Share my screen. Commenting on the almost total blindness of male historians via Abyss, the obvious female orientation of the Upper Paleolithic, William Irwin Thompson writes, because we have separated humanity from nature, subject from object, values from analysis, knowledge from myth, and universities from the universe, It is enormously difficult for anyone but a poet or a mystic to understand what is going on in the holistic and mythopoeic thought of Ice Age humanity. The very language we use to discuss the past speaks of tools, hunters, and men. When every statue and painting we discover cries out to us that this Ice Age humanity was a culture of art, the love of animals, and women. Gathering is is as important as hunting, but only hunting is discussed. Storytelling is discussed, but the storyteller is a hunter rather than an old priestess of the moon. Initiation is imagined, but the initiate is not the young girl in Monarch about to be wed to the moon, but a young man about to become a great hunter. What the historians leave blank, our imaginations can fill in with bright pictures like those covering the sacred cave walls. We know that women's religious rights were never separable from a totality of art, magic, and social and physical realities. The matrifocal group organized its power into a religious and cultural human expression through the medium of art. Art was the tool of the connection, the manifest vision, expressing experience of a single life-giving principle conserved in the changeless other world of the deep caves where there is perpetual darkness and times become spatial, resonant, and static. In such a standing silence as within a giant living skull, the dream images make themselves known. The great goddess was the mother of wild animals. The inner recesses and womb walls of the caverns were alive with magic pictures of her breast. She was herself an animal, all the animals. In many of the early images, she wears an animal mask. As in ancient Chinese Taoism, so in Western pagan religions, the female principle was the transforming animal, the energy of metamorphosis and hence evolution. The brilliant rush of European animal imagery from Cro-Magnon through Celtic, Nordic, and Teutonic art and incorporated into medieval bestiaries and illuminated manuscripts expressed this primal dynamic vision of evolutionary energy as a surge of spirit into multitudinous forms. The goddess kept her various animal shapes for many thousands of years, among them the doe, the owl, the hare, the vulture, the pig, the cow, the wild mare, the lioness, the crow, the crane, the salmon, the jackal, the hermaphroditic snail, the serpent, the wren, the butterfly, and the chrysalis, the spider. Early human attitude toward animals was totemistic. Totem means related through the mother. The blood clan's solidarity was identified with some specific plant or animal. Through the totem, the life of the human group and the ongoing life of nature were made inseparable. This is the meaning of sacrament. 
the absorption by humans of the non-human or cosmic flow of forms. The secret spirit lives in and through the multitude of plant and animal forms which the goddess can assume at will. This means that any tree or beast, bird or fish or insect is symbolically potentially her and must be related to with magic and respect. Individual members of a species die, but the group form remains, is permanent, is one of the great mother's ideal forms. This is the primal conception of reincarnation. Later, European pagans believed in individual soul reincarnation through many forms, animal and human and demonic, as the mechanism of biological as well as spiritual evolution. The animism of primal peoples has been called childish. In fact, it is a profound ex experiential perception of the evolutionary relation between all life forms as manifestations of the original one. The first cell from which all life multiplied, the original cosmic egg. When human survival depends on such a sensitive rapport with the environment, as it always has and always will, such a conception is not infantile, but crucial. Human survival does indeed depend on a sacramental relation to nature. Now that this relation has been betrayed and destroyed, we know how important it is and is. A sacramental bond between our earliest human ancestors and the natural world was the primary factor in our evolution. Not simply as a physical species, but as conscious beings. For this bonding set up a resonance in which all art, all religious ritual, all magic, alchemic science, all spiritual striving for illumination was born. As primal people have always experienced it, when you look and listen to nature, something happens. Something always speaks. Animism is still a valid relationship. If modern man neither sees nor hears, the fault is in his head, sensorium. In primitive belief, no animal can be killed against its wish. When a member of a species is struck down, the one is wounded. Therefore, the hunter must fast and pray to the animal spirit before the hunt, not simply to ask its pardon, but to gain its assent to being killed. The hunted animal is seen to give itself to the hunter as human food, while its spirit returns to the group form. Because men did all the large game hunting and felt themselves to be tracking and slaying brother and sister animals, magic children like themselves of Mother Earth, we know they felt guilt and sought its resolution. After the spilling of blood, one must restore harmony with the dead animal and with the mother of animals as its soul persists through the multiplicity of lives and deaths. Cave paintings from the Upper Paleolithic show stick figure male hunters or entranced shamans alongside beautifully rendered bison and other game animals. The hunter's or shaman's spear may be shown juxtaposed with the vulvas of female animals. They were seeing the animal's wound as a magic vulva of the goddess and trying to establish a union or symbolic resolution within the violence of killing as penis to vulva, which bleeds and heals itself, so spear to wound. Rock carvings and paintings found in North Africa, identical and themed to the European cave paintings, make this analogy between penis and arrow, goddesses vulva and animal womb with circular lines returning the energy in a vulva to vulva cycle. In all these Stone Age depictions of the hunt, there is not one image of aggressive or bloodthirsty hunters engaged in wanton slaughter. There are only images of prayerful petition and worshipful observation. As Thompson points out, these Paleolithic paintings of vulvas as magic wounds that heal themselves or give birth to new life continue as symbolic images through Western religious history. 
Medieval paintings show Christ exposing his womb from which blood and water flowed during the crucifixion as from a uterus in childbirth. The labial wound in the side of Christ is an expression that the male shaman to have magical power must take on the power of woman. The magical labial wound is the seal of the resurrection and an expression of the myth of eternal recurrence. From Christ to the Fisher King of the Grail legends, the man suffering from a magical wound is no ordinary man. He is the man who has transcended the duality of sexuality, the man with a vulva, the shamanistic androgyny. These pagan meanings were kept alive, not in Orthodox Christianity, certainly, but in the Gnostic tradition, which recognized magic bisexuality, the alchemical androgyny. The, necess the necessity of the male to experience his female womb. The Grail legend has been traced back to the Neolithic Near Eastern goddess religion, but in fact, it goes back much further to the sacred Cro-Magnon caves and the Stone Age hunters attempt to resolve bloodletting guilt symbolically and ecstatically through a fusion of his sex spirit with the magic vulva wound of the mother goddess. Ritual cannibalism began with the same symbolic desire, not solely to propitiate, but to participate in the magic life-death rebirth process. A, among primal people, the totemic animal is sometimes eaten as a sacrament by the group, or it is totally avoided as a group taboo. Either way, human hunger, killing, and eating are felt as unbalancing acts which must be reharmonized through sacramental rites. Ritual cannibalism doubtless began with sharing eaten, eating of the totem animal, a taking in of the animal's life force by the group. To participate in its death, in its lifeblood, is to partake of its eternal rebirth in the mother. Where it occurred in the world, ritual cannibalism like hunting was predominantly or exclusively a male activity. We can see in it early man's desire not to separate himself and to reestablish magic bonds with the mother after the spilling of her blood. This sacred cannibalism is still practiced symbolically in the Christian communion. Another mode of group intoxication of ecstatic rebalancing is the dance. Sacred circles made with stones are found in the deep Paleolithic caves and in them the traces of human feet that danced around and around. Cave paintings show the shaman dancing in animal skins and antler headdress. The footmarks on the cave floors reveal generations of ritual dancing by all women, men, children. Dancing to and with the spirits of the animals is the most ancient human ceremony that we know. Mask dances like dancing the maze were a deliberate means of approach to the biomystical animal world and to the great mother within and beyond all forms. Pantomimic dance is of the essence of each and every mystery function. In Themis, Jane Ellen Harrison describes how the primal dancing group projects its aroused energies outward into the creation of a god, beginning with mimetic rites, wearing animal masks, feathers, horns, and claws, dancing to a common rhythm, common excitement. Members of the group become emotionally supercharged and one. Initially, no God concept is involved, but the collective emotion is overwhelmingly felt as something more than the experience of the individual, as something dominant and external. Dithyram meant originally song of birth. The ecstatic choric dance literally gave birth to the God, group emotional energy becomes the raw material of the Godhead. In time, a leader of the dance is slowly differentiated. The dancers become audience worshipers of something beyond. Prayer and sacrifice reveals that severance is complete. 
the community of emotion ceases restructured into hierarchic observance and the primal chorus loses all sense of memory that the god is themselves we forget the god is always ourselves Harrison's description shows the social and sheer biological origins of religion, the creation of divinity, not from private prayer or individual moral abstraction, but from its uh, thonic roots in physical, collective, ecstatic energies. Like many early 20th century students of ancient mythology, however, Harrison's thought reveals a Freudian influence. A belief the creation of quote unquote God is only a one way process. Like Freud, Harrison sourced human cultural expression, art, dance, religion, in quote unquote unsatisfied desire, and seemed to agree that all experience of the sacred was reducible to psychological quote unquote projection. Witness the analytic urge to demystify the mystery. The Freudian school knew no quantum physics or energies beyond the human, but there are other dimensions than the spatially, temporally tangible, even though the linear mind is not structured to perceive them. Spiritual or magical experience is an impingement of these other dimensions, other force fields into our ordinary rational reality. A dancing group can project its entrenched emotion into Godhead. Through a trance and rhythmic opening of psychic channels, it can also introject the Godhead or quote unquote pulling down transhuman powers. Both directions of this process can really occur simultaneously. The group generates and renews the power. The power generates and renews the group. The spiraling process gives birth in both directions. Later, priestly ideas that the quote unquote gods demand constant human supplication, obeisance, and abasement are wrong and exploitive. But they derive from this genuine primordial perception of an energy exchange between humans and transhuman powers, a vibratory field communication that must go both ways for the connection to work. Chimpanzees do rain dances for no logical reason other than to reconnect their animal energies with the transhuman energies of rain, thunder, and lightning, the original chemical dance of life. And the ap apocryphal Jesus says, the whole on high hath part in our dancing. Who danceth not knoweth not what cometh to pass. This idea is incorporated in the Gnostic round dance, but its origins are not in Christianity by any means, but in the earliest pagan Paleolithic sacred cave dances, even beyond that, in the dances of chimpanzees and beyond that in the first circling dances of molecules, of atoms, of quarks around the cosmic spiral. The sacred dance takes us beyond the god of morality and back to the goddess of ecstasy. Beyond obeisance to social hierarchy and back to an original communion with sheer evolutionary energy. That is why such Gnostic texts were branded apocryphal and why the medieval Gnostics were persecuted and burned at the stake by the Orthodox Church because they spoke a pagan and primordial truth old as the universe who is the first dancer one of the earliest images we know of the mother of wild animals and the dance is the venus of la salle a bas relief from a cave in the door dog the dorgan valley france dating circa 19,000 bc this icon shows the great mother standing with a bison horn upheld in her right hand. Okay, the horn is a lunar crescent and the relief is painted with red ochre, the magic color of menstruation and birth. 
Such a figure presided over the mask shamanic dances and the circle dances of communion with all animals, all life in which blood, woman, moon, bison, horn, birth, magic, the cycle of life are analogized in a continuous resonance or harmony of sacred energies. This LaSalle great mother holding the lunar horn became the virgin and the unicorn, one horn of medieval legend. The marvelous tapestries of the Middle Ages, all woven by women, frequently tell the story of the unicorn who may be touched and tamed only by a chaste virgin. As Thompson notes, the unicorn is a lunar symbol of the ancient religion of Europe, the great mother religion, and the ritual drama of the macho hunter chasing and slaying this magic beast represents a trans memory of the shift from the moon worshiping metrifocal European pagan society, slaying this magic, I'm sorry, the European pagan society to the patriarchal sun worship of the Roman Empire and the Christian church. Such traces of the Paleolithic hunt goddess and her magic relation to all the beasts can be found throughout European folklore, art, alchemy, witchcraft, and other heresies. They can also be found throughout the world, Asia, Africa, the Americas. They are found everywhere human beings are found because they represent our original heart and mind. Among the Stone Age, cave paintings are images of great women with upraised arms, some with their arms supported by smaller male figures on their side. Legendarily, sacred women stood in this position during the hunt, acting as receivers of cosmic energy. Among the African Stone Age cliff paintings found by Mary Leakey in central Tanzania, the hunt dancers are almost always women who move their bodies in the shapes and gestures of the animals. Among the Kalahari Bushmen today, a shaman woman performs a special invocation dance on the dawn of the hunt day, invoking the protective dawn star or Venus, who is called the hunter and communing with the spirits of the animals who will voluntarily die to feed humans. Among these Kalahari aboriginals, also the Milky Way was created by a young girl in Monarch who feeling lonely threw the ashes of her fire into the night sky to create a friendly light for her people. The African Hottentots sing and chant to the rain spirit who is a pregnant moon goddess called Goro. Though who has painted thy body red, thou who does not drop the menses. Before their invocation dance, they paint their bodies red with ochre, which is called Gorod, after, the, after her blood red color. Australian aboriginals pour blood over their sacred stones and ritually paint themselves red after their dances, saying the paint is really women's menstrual blood. And this is the crane dance from June 1976. When we think of the 21,000 year old Venus of LaSalle stained with red ochre and holding up the hunter's lunar crescent horn in the sacred cave, we know what all these same rites, images, and analogies mean and where they come from. They come from our original selves as children of the great mother, as sisters and brothers of all her magic animals. The rites, icons, and dances conceive the earth as the body of the mother and try to restore the harmony lost when she is wounded. They aim to relate the beast wounds to her magic vulva, which bleeds with the moon and heals itself again and again. In this way, the species spirit of the animals may be renewed through rebirth after the killing of individual members. Surely in these dances and rituals, we see the world meaning of all religious symbolism, but more clearly and beautifully because closer to the source. Western history does not show us any evolution toward greater spirit, greater meaning, greater culture. 
the Western Roman Christian contribution to the world, when we look at it, has been almost entirely in the area of technology and of analytical intellect combined with a notorious spiritual and cultural alienation and perhaps the lonely the loneliest individuals the planet has ever seen. What there still is of spirit, of poetry, of coherent meaning, of symbolic truth in the world did not come from us. It was there at the beginning among our Stone Age ancestors. Their vision, their cosmology, their intuited truth and sacred analogies run like bright red threads through the tapestry of Western history. Whatever is still alive and vibrating in patriarchal religions, especially Christianity, when traced to its source, is found to be one of those bloody living fibers retained or stolen from the original Paleolithic cosmology. Woven by these Ice Age people out of their primal pagan experience of the Great Mother and her magic world. What has followed them in the mythic, religious, spiritual, and psychic realms at least has been no great advance, but a, de a devolution, a corruption, a narrowing and hardening, an at atrophy of vision and heart. Our Stone Age ancestors would have no trouble understanding the words of Smoala, a Nez Perce, who sang the primal truth to the white man's world of 19th century business and re resource development oriented America. My young men shall never work. Men who work cannot dream and wisdom comes in dreams. You ask me to plow the ground. Shall I take a knife and tear my mother's breast? Then will I die. She will not take me to her bosom to rest. You ask me to dig for stone. Shall I dig under her skin for bones? Then when I die, I cannot enter her body and be born again. You ask me to cut grass and make hay and sell it and be rich like the white man. But how can I cut off my mother's hair? It is bad law and my people cannot obey it. I want my people to stay with me here. All the dead humans will come to life again. We must wait here in the house of our ancestors and be ready to meet in the body of our mother. Women's culture and religion in Neolithic times. The Triple Goddess, 1973. The first settled villages. The Neolithic revolution occurring circa 10,000 BC was the creation of women. Through the long generations of human evolution, it was the females who had dug the earth for food, gathering roots and grasses, wild grains and berries to be used for nourishment, medicine and clothing fibers. Women were the skilled observers of plant nature passing on from generation to generation their knowledge of food, medical, toxic, and mind-changing properties of the wild plants, fungi, and herbs in their environment. And it was women who had a special relation to the earth as daughters related to the body of the Great Mother, where groups of women and their children settled, culture took root, growing slowly into Neolithic villages. During the Paleolithic or Old Stone Age, the centers of the cave culture that we know of were in Western and Southern Europe. As the last glaciers receded and human migration increased, centers of human culture shifted to the, most, the moist and fertile valleys of the Near East, where the first systematic cultivation of grain occurred. While wheat and emmer grew there, water conditions were good and there were wild goats to be domesticated. By 7000 BC, agriculture was well established in Jordan, Iran, and Anatolia or modern Turkey. These new Stone Age people were matriarchal and goddess worshippers. They entered Anatolia and the Near East via Thrace, the Balkans. There were, the, there were three centers of settled agriculture in the Near East on the western slopes and valleys of the Zagros Mountains where the Tigris empties into the Persian Gulf. 
in the hill country of Turkish Syrian Mesopotamia and on the South Anatolian plain, now Western Turkey. Some of the oldest known settlements and the oldest known grain sickle have been found in the area of Palestine. These are the remains of the Natufian Neolithic culture, which lasted until circa 6,000 BC. The people of the most ancient city of Tel as Sultan, now Jericho, practiced a cult of skulls and buried their dead in deep pits under the floors of their houses. The first layer of the city dates from 8,000 to 7,000 BC and was built in the shape of the crescent moon. At its earliest levels, the culture seems very advanced. The houses were built in beehive shape, constructed with sun-dried clay bricks. Floors were sunk into the earth, strewn with sand and covered with clay. Timber was also used in construction. Remains of a wooden staircase have been found. The city is surrounded by an 18 foot high wall of regularly shaped stones. And this is surrounded by a protecting ditch or moat 27 feet wide, cut nine feet deep into the solid rock. Architecture and building techniques at Till El as Sultan are at least as advanced as those of medieval European fortresses. The strange thing is that no tools for cutting such huge stone blocks, no axes, picks, chisels have been found. In the rooms of all the houses were found images of the goddess. Jericho was founded at the site of a sacred spring and the original structure beneath many layers of debris from later buildings have been identified as a shrine to the local spirit. Successive cities were built around the same sacred place, the spirit of which became the founding deity. She received the sacrifices offered by the settlers, perhaps in expi expiation for, quote unquote, using the earth body in this new agricultural way. And she gave the law by which the city was governed. Implicit in this law was a contract between humans and the goddess. The people permitted a conditional use of the land for farming and building in return for observances paid to the goddess. The next oldest settlement in the area dates from 6500 BC. These people built triangular houses with rooms more than 21 feet long and 12 feet wide around a courtyard with a central hearth. The bricks were given a plaster coating and there are no corners or broken lines in this architecture. The walls are gently curved, molded by hand as the Pueblo houses of the American Southwest are still hand adobe today by the women. The walls were painted red or yellow and were highly burnished. These houses had drains. Spindle whorls and loom weights were found in the ruins, but no traces of pottery. The women used stone vessels. A chapel has been found containing a stole minher, a carved stone pillar with oval point and breast representing the great goddess. The best known of these Anatolian cities is Catalhuyuk, excavated by James Mollart in the 1960s. This complex town, a ceremonial center of the goddess religion, flowered between 6500 and 5650 BC. Catalhuyuk was very large for its day, 30 to 35 acres in extent. Twelve successive layers have been excavated and no signs of warfare or weaponry weaponry have been found. There are also no signs of animal slaughter within the town, though there are murals depicting the old ritual of the hunt. The people were peaceful agriculturalists, mostly vegetarian. Catalhuyuk was situated near the obsidian trade routes and was a major trading center for giants and probably also religious, I'm sorry, for grains and probably also religious icons. Women's skills as gardeners and agriculturalists are manifest here. The presence of numerous querns, mortars, pounders, grinders, storage pits, and sickle blades shows a growing abundance of food. 
and burial sites containing luxury objects indicate a surplus of goods and therefore trade. There are many obsidian objects and cowrie shells, goddess symbols from coastal regions. At Kadalhuyuk, the most honored burials were of women and children. Before burial, bodies were exposed so their bones could be picked clean by vultures, the sacred bird of the death goddess. Women and children were buried in central graves directly under the sleeping platforms inside the houses, with signs of ritual respect and love amulets and icons, obsidian mirrors and toys buried with them. Men were buried in smaller corner sites, never with children and with their stone age hunt weapons. The whole town seems to have been dedicated to the great mother religion and to religious artist, artistry. artistry. At least 40 shrines have been found in Kadalhuyuk, all of the goddess. Murals on temple walls show shaman women as vultures. Women's breasts are molded in relief on shrine walls surmounted by cow horns and surrounded by imprints of human hands, the same handprints found throughout the Paleolithic caves. Here, the great goddess is shown in in mural images and statues. In her triple aspect as a young woman, a mother giving birth and an old woman or crone accompanied by a vulture. These are the three phases of the moon, waxing, full, and whining. Kadalhuyuk also was built over a sacred well and the site designed in coordination with natural and cosmic laws. The lines and centers of the earth's energies and the positions of the stars. To build at a place was to share the life of that place. It was an organic and spiritual location. Earliest agriculture must have grown up around the shrines of the Great Mother, which were social and trade centers as well as holy places. The priestesses of the goddess were also administrators, scribes, and traders. The goddess of the Neolithic became the teacher of planting, harvesting, and storage methods, as well as healer and dispenser of curative herbs, roots, and plants. Eric Fromm, in The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, speculates on the meaning of this culture. The fact that among hundreds of skeletons covering at least 800 years of continuous culture, not one shows signs of violent death. The fact that women seemed to outnumber men and are buried with greater honor, the fact that the religion of Kadalhuyuk, administered by priestesses, stressed the renewing and protecting powers of the Great Mother, he writes. The data that speak in favor of the view that Neolithic society was relatively egalitarian without hierarchy, exploitation, or marked aggression are suggestive. The fact, however, that these Neolithic villages in Anatolia had a matriarchal or matricentric structure adds a great deal more evidence to the hypothesis that Neolithic society, at least in Anatolia, was an essentially unaggressive and peaceful society. The reason for this lies in the spirit of affirmation of life and a lack of destructiveness, which J.J. Bakovan believed was an essential trait of all matriarchal societies. Southeast Europe, the bird and snake goddess. The goddess religion was carried into the Near East by descendants of the European Old Stone Age. They entered Anatolia via the Bosporus and the Dardanelles Straits, bearing with them countless generations of cultural, social, and spiritual development centered on the worship of the Great Mother. The Balkan re region of Southeast Europe, known in the ancient world as Thrace, was one of the sites of this development. It was previously assumed that agriculture and Neolithic culture generally originated in the Near East and spread from there to Europe in the fourth millennium BC. It has now been shown that the movement could have been in the other direction. An independent Neolithic culture existed in Southeast Europe circa 7,000 through 3,500 BC. 
This matristic culture was similar to those in Anatolian, Near Eastern, and Egyptian regions, but did not derive from them. It is likely that all were seeds dropped on the way of the outward migrations of Paleolithic cave people following the recession of the Ice Age. The Southeast Europeans lived in small townships with laid out streets. They farmed domesticated animals, developed poet pottery, and used sophisticated bone and stone carving techniques. Located on five seas, the Adriatic, the Ionian, the Aegean, and Marmara, and the Black Sea, these people traded at great distances on seas and inland waterways, transporting many items, including native obsidian, alabaster, and marble. They might have traded obsidian to Catalhuyuk as early as 7000 BC. The Benka culture, near present Belgrade and Yugoslavia, flourished circa 5300 to 4000 BC. These people built large settlements of two and three room houses. 2000 figurines of the goddess have been found in the excavations. And the first attempts at linear writing appeared there, not later than mid 6th millennium BC. On spindle whorls, figurines and vessels all related to women and the goddess. The bird and snake goddess reigned supreme. As archaeologist Marija Gimbutas notes, she was a combined snake and water bird with a long phallic neck, descended from the Magdalenian goddess of the European Old Stone Age, and she was the quote unquote the feminine principle. In the Vinca houses were sacred corners with domed altars, the altar pieces in the shape of the bird goddess with upraised arms. She wore a bird beaked wooden mask, the receptacle of invisible forces, which some of her mysteries were enacted in natural caves. Miniature, repli miniature replicas of temples have been found showing whole buildings made fantastically in the shape of the bird goddess. The Vinca and surrounding Southeast European cultures were largely destroyed by invaders from the East. These were semi-nomadic pastoralists, Aryan ancestors of the Indo-Europeans, who disturbed most of Central and Eastern Europe during the 4th millennium BC. In their aggressive infiltration and settlement, these invaders destroyed a good deal of the goddess culture and incorporated what they could not destroy. They also interbred, producing the mixed Gauls, Celts, Teutons, and the other later invaders of Western Europe. Only around the Aegean did the earlier matriarchal European Neolithic culture survive, survive unbroken into the end of the third millennium BC and on Crete in the form of Minoan culture until the mid second millennium BC. But Thrace remained a major center radiating ancient knowledge down to the Pythagorean times. In the first sex, Elizabeth Gold Davis notes that the classical Greeks found evidence there of an ancient technology far beyond their own. Herodotus wrote, the Thracians dwell amid lofty mountains clothed with forests and capped by snow. Their oracle is situated upon their highest mountaintop and their prophet is a woman. According to Apuleius, Thrace was the original home of witchcraft, woman wisdom. It was also the home of the nine muses called mountain goddesses by Herodotus. Thus the legendary home of magic poetry, the wild and mysterious maenads. And it was also the homeland of one of the original Amazon tribes warrior women who later fought in Greece against the patriarchal armies. Davis speculates that Thrace was the germinating center for all the later civilizations of Sumer, Crete, Egypt. This may or may not be so, at least it was a strong link between original European goddess cultures and the matriarchal centers of the Neolithic Natufians, Catalhuyuk, Hasselar, and other Anatolian and Near Eastern sites. In Thrace, the goddess was worshipped as the moon, 
Diana, Selene, and the nine muses or mountain goddesses were her nine magical aspects. The maenads were her oracular priestess shamans, custodians of her primal wisdom, and legendary teachers of the later Celtic Druids who worshipped Siridwen, mountain goddess of inspiration. Orpheus, the mythic poet shaman, came from Thrace. Davis thinks he was murdered by the Maenads for revealing their ritual secrets. Thracian Maenad teaching on the immortality of the soul and the theory of reincarnation influenced Pythagoras as late as 5th century BC. Some years back, there was an exhibition on Thracian treasures at the British Museum in London. The catalog describes a rich culture in Thrace between 6,000 through 4,000 BC. This culture belonged to an unknown and mysterious people. Scholars cannot explain it. Walls were made with lath and plaster. Local pottery, gracefully made from its, begin its very beginnings, was often brightly colored and richly ornamented. In Thrace, as in Asia Minor, it is images of the mother goddess which predominate in the idols made of clay and bone. About 2800 BC, far-reaching changes took place throughout the Bronze Age, changes which contributed to the disappearance of all graces of this culture and were strongly connected with centralized rule. What is never spelled out is that centralized rule was introduced with patriarchy culture declined for hundreds of years, etc., etc., during which the ancient magical science was destroyed and forgotten and patriarchal rapine ruled. Everywhere in the exhibit where images of the goddess appeared, and there were plenty dated from 4000 BC and earlier, she is called an idol or fertility figurine. There was a pottery model of a circular shrine enclosing three huge images of the goddess with arms upraised. There were many goblets and vases decorated with heads of warrior women. Yet the catalog does not want to speculate on the meaning of these objects. Instead, one is giving, given plenty of information about patriarchal Thrace in later times. Men had many wives. The women did all the work, both at home and in the fields. The men considered it shameful to till the land, and their noblest occupation was to go to war and to be tattooed. So is our her story taken from us by male archaeologists and historians posing as objective researchers. The Megalithic Tomb the moon and the stone. Most high Neolithic cultures in the Near East developed gradually from village settlements into city centers around 5,000 to 4,000 BC. Perhaps this was the golden age in this part of the world, a time of peaceful and creative life in the Jordan Valley, kept alive in later myths and legends. And perhaps the same peaceful, settled existence was ongoing at the time, at the same time in other parts of the East, in India, in Africa, and Western Europe. From diggings, we know that the dead were no longer buried deep under the house floors, nor entombed in oven-shaped chambers cut in the rock of caves. Now they were given more monumental habitations in the form of rock chambers or stone structures built on the ground, covered with artificial earth mounds. These are the megalithic tombs or dolmens. The dolmen itself, a chamber formed of great upright stones roofed with a top stone, was seen as having great healing powers. Stones shaped by water, wind, the earth were believed to be the habitation of the goddess. In some stone chambers, the portal stone was carved out to resemble the birth canal. The dead, still buried in fetal position, were placed in the womb of the great mother, awaiting rebirth. Still later, women, being the farmers, gardeners, and keepers of the grain, buried their dead in great egg-shaped pithoi or clay storage urns under the ground. Always a connection was made between the miraculous growth of the plant from a seed buried in the earth and the dead body 
planted also in the earth with the hope of regeneration through her womb powers. The women drew on their daily practical experiences as agriculturalists to create elaborate new myths of cyclic birth, death, and resurrection. With the spread of settled agriculture, this new culture and its religious symbols blossomed everywhere. The Middle East, India through Europe and into Scandinavia, Britain and Spain, the Mediterranean islands, North and West Africa. The ancient primordial symbols remain, but in a, more, in a much more elaborate and permanent form. The great cosmic mountain mother, who was the mother of wild animals, who was the dark ocean and the night and day sky, begets the silver egg or fruit of her night sky, the moon. She is both moon and earth, and the ancient bird and snake goddess of water and air begets a daughter, the pregnant earth goddess of vegetation, the green child. Both mother and daughter are linked with the moon. The massive great mother of the old stone age begins to share her powers with a new goddess, the strong young daughter of agricultural skills ruled by the moon. The moon as daughter of the great mother is known as the triple goddess. She presides over all acts of generation, whether physical, intellectual, or spiritual. Her triple aspect expresses the three phases of the moon, waxing or growth, full rebirth and wanting periodic death she is as the new or waxing moon the white goddess of birth and growth she is as the full moon the red goddess of love and battle she is as the old or wanting moon the black goddess of death and divination these are the three phases of a woman's life all natural and all magical biological phases are also spiritual phases Transience and immortality are different aspects of the same goddess. The moon as the daughter fruit of the great mother's sky expresses the essential unity and perpetual change of her cosmos. Moon and sun are the eyes of the heavenly mother, the all-seeing one. We still talk of heavenly bodies and of stars looking down on us, and we still experience the universe as a larger symbolic body, as macrocosm to microcosm or as mythic mother to daughter. The three cyclic phases of the ever-turning moon should remind us that our minds are not primordial, primordially dualistic, but structured to flow through changes, always conscious of the one, while experiencing the whole range of diverse psychic manifestations. Men's, the word for mind, is also the word for moon. On ancient images of the goddess, we find the spiral symbol, one ending rolling upward and the other downward by the genital triangle. When represented by this double spiral, she is never solely the goddess of fertility, pregnancy, and birth. She is always at the same time goddess of death and the dead. Bearing on her belly the continuous rising and descending spiral, she expresses the constant double motion of the cosmos. In megalithic art, the goddess as giver of life is depicted naturalistically and sensually. But as ruler over the spirits and the dead, her form stresses the unnatural, the surreal, and the psychic spiritual. She is then figured in weird, fantastic, hermaphroditic, or phallic shapes. She is hallucinated into composite monster animals like the Sphinx or the later Griffin and Abraxas. Or in a stylized form called the Eye Goddess, she becomes simply a double spiraling, a double spiral representing her cosmic magic eyes. This eye goddess design is found on poetry, on pottery, on statues, on clay and bone implements all over the Near East and Europe. On the New Grange burial mound in County Meath, Ireland, the double spiral marks the main stones. The goddess receives there the first rays of the sun's rebirth on winter solstice. And the same design appears on stones on 
Malta, Crete, and in Scandinavia, and inside burial changers through France and Brittany. The eye spirals are often mistakenly called cup and ring marks and assumed by male archaeologists to be quote unquote sun wheels. Carved in grim relief inside burial mounds in Brittany, the eye goddess stares forward, seeing death and life equally. The funerary mode mood is expressed in the stylized abstraction of her gaze, reducing complex existence to the stark essentials of seeing and the invisible. Nature is both growth and decay, and life cannot be without death. Such is the unblinking vision of the eye goddess. Stone in Neolithic times, as in the Paleolithic, remains the powerful abode of the great goddess. Stone of all earth forms is immortal and unchanging symbol of permanence. As the bones of the earth, the pelvic walls of caverns, it gives off a profound vibration of resonance, both subhuman and supernatural. All primitive people carry wishbones and healing stones, talismans painted with magic symbols. Animals as well as humans seem drawn to tall standing menhirs or stone pillars. Sick livestock rub against them in the countryside and it is timeless folk custom to touch menhirs in order to become fertile or to be cured of illness. Legends often refer to stone circles like in Brittany and Cornwall in Ireland and England as nine maidens or merry maidens. Nine is the magic number of the moon and the Thracian muses. To explain these circles, it is said that nine naughty young women were turned into stone by the avenging Christian God for dancing on his Sabbath. It has been suggested that a specific number of women or girls dancing in a circle at certain speeds and all singing or humming the appropriate note, young women having high piping voices, might set up a vibratory resonance in the stone circle, subjecting each stone to a burst of sound energy as each woman passed it and this energy traveling from stone to stone. The ultrasound in the voices or music would act on the crystal structure of the stone. It has recently been found that the quartz content of such stones is an electrically active crystal and that certain standing stones associated with the stone circles generate ultrasound when stimulated by the elements in the electromagnetic spectrum radiated by the sun at dawn. In England, genea geologists and ley line hunters, why hunter, why not seeker? are working together in the Dragon Project, physically monitoring and measuring radiation and energies emanating from standing stones and stone circles. At different times of the day, at different times of day and night, lunar and solar risings and settings, and at different seasons. In Neolithic times, the moon and the stone symbols were combined in one characteristic shape, the horned altar. Anything shaped like a crescent moon was considered by analogy to belong to the triple goddess. Thus, where horses' hooves struck crescent marks on the earth, the moon ran and the wild mare belonged to her. The curving lunar horns of cows and bulls, goats, oxen, and other herd animals were held sacred and adorned and the horn cr crown became the magic adornment of warriors, rulers, and priests of the late Neolithic. Horned Teutonic warrior women and the horned Pan, pagan god of nature, Pan means all, belong to this tradition. And this is why the Christian devil is depicted wearing horns. From Upper Paleolithic times, we have the Venus of La Salle and other cave images of women wearing or holding horns and figurines of horns with women's breasts. There were also images of the pregnant doe and her magic antlers. Northern hunting people still see the mother of the universe as a doe, elk, or wild reindeer. There are myths of pregnant women who rule the hearth rule the heart of the world covered with hair and with branching deer's horns on their head. 
The deer was still sacred to Artemis and Diana, goddesses of the moon in later times. The doe's udders were seen to be sources of rainwater and the growth of her antlers was magically connected with the growth of the crescent moon, both symbolizing growth and regeneration. The symbol of the Sumerian goddess of childbirth was a stag. Apparently, there was a synchronicity between the growth cycle of the stag's antlers and that of spring-grown Neolithic cereal grains. In later Celtic and Teutonic myth, the fairy transformed herself most commonly into a magic deer, and she lived within an earth mound, the pregnant womb of the goddess. A whole complex of symbols is associated with this Neolithic religion of the great goddess. The sacred pillar, the horns, the cosmic snake and egg, the labyrinth, the world tree, the dove, the swastika, the sacrificial double axe or labrys, the bee, the butterfly, and the chrysalis. The horned altar, the, the cow's horns shaped in stone or clay, the likeness of the young crescent moon stood for new growth and fertility. It also meant that it also meant the simultaneously wanting crescent, the dying moon. These altars are found in megalithic tombs, but agricultural rites of the horned altar were also performed for the living group, just as earlier Paleolithic people had performed magic cave rituals to encourage the birth and capture of the hunter's animal quarry. In the settled Neolithic where people depended on cultivated crops, the seasons and the weather, horned altar ceremonies were enacted to help the rebirth of the new moon, to assist crop growth and harvest, to renew the fertility of the fields each year. So bringing about the resurrection of the daughter vegetable life through the mother earth and moon. When plowing developed, it was a part of funerary rites. The sacred pillar, along with the horned altars, were sacred stone objects standing in the open country, along roads, and in the village. Also descended from the old Stone Age, they were phallic pillars with the Great Mother carved on them. Stone pillars with breasts are found throughout the Near East. As Gimbutas suggested, these ancient phallic mother stones symbolized shamanic bisexuality and the unity of the sexes a Neolithic ideal stressed in ritual and imagery. The cosmic snake and egg derived from the original goddess cosmology and continue to represent wisdom, immortality, continuity within change and the magic germ or steel heart center within the whirling negative positive spiral field of cosmic energy. The labyrinth also continues the earlier Paleolithic rituals of the underground cave, the initiation maze dance through life and death. Serpent and maze designs are common symbols on Neolithic pottery worldwide, and in urban times, they were incorporated in floor mosaics. In Neolithic Western Europe and in Neolithic North America, giant burial mounds were built in the shape of serpents with spirals engraved on their stones. The world tree is another worldwide symbol found everywhere among Neolithic agricultural people. The world tree also existed among earlier Stone Age hunting and gathering cultures. Shamans in trance climbed the world tree, which is the human spine and the spine of the world, to receive illumination. The Neolithic world tree appears in a garden abundant with fruits and grains. It reflects the agricultural concerns of settled people when the energy bonds between human society and the cycles of vegetable life were stressed and also coming under human control. The world tree incorporates serpentine and lunar symbolism, shedding bark and leaves like skin or light, being reborn in the spring, growing rhythmically with the monthly moon phases. At least 2,000 years before the Hebrew patriarchs wrote of the Garden of Eden, the Neolithic great goddess had her magic garden of immortality. Clay seals and figurines from Sumer and Crete show her sitting in the garden 
in her garden the branches of the world tree overspreading bundles of fruits and grains, a crescent moon over her shoulder, and some were twined around the tree trunk or stretched on the ground at her feet, the cosmic serpent. In some fertilizing rivers, meander, meander lines pour in from the four directions. Such images of peaceful abundance are the apotheosis of the Neolithic. The dove is often pictured there too, perched in the world tree as the symbol of the great mothers all giving love as the vulture meant all taking death. Doves continued through Roman times to be the companions of the love goddess Venus as well as biblical symbols of peace. In the image of the cosmic tree penetrating the three sacred zones of heaven, earth, and underworld, the threefold structure of the universe is expressed. Also, the threefold structure of the human brain, the original reptilian brain stem, surrounded by the mammalian cerebrum and all enveloped by the human neocortex. The reptile brain is the secret dream underground. The mammal brain is abundant earth. The human neocortex is the flying bird who sits in the world tree and climb and can climb the sky. Wherever bird and snake appear together, as in the Thracian bird and snake goddess, they are seen, they are to be seen as the upper and lower symbols of the world tree. And it is understood that the world tree, which is the spine, the arousal of Kundalini through the chakras, connects them. In the presence of this Neolithic world tree symbol, one is the presence of the most ancient shamanistic trans power and of yoga. Both are magic techniques of the great mother. In the Hebrew Genesis, Eve and Adam are driven from the garden of immortality by Yahweh because they consort with the cosmic serpent under this magic world tree. The Genesis tree was not an apple, but a fig tree. Eve and Adam covered their nakedness with fig leaves after eating of its fruit in, the, in Eden. Hathor, the cow goddess of Egypt, was anciently identified with the fig tree, which was known as the living body of Hathor on earth. To eat of its sweet pulpy fruit, it its very vulva-like fruit, was to eat of her flesh and fluid. The fig tree was also sacred on Crete, considered the food of eternity and immortality. The biblical Garden of Eden was, in fact, the entire Near Eastern, North African, and Mediterranean Neolithic agricultural world of the great goddess. And the forbidden tree and evil serpent represented her ancient magic powers of illumination and immortality and earthly peace. The swastika is one of the most ancient abstract symbols. It is found scratched on Siberian clay figures of wild geese on the underside of their wings from the earliest Neolithic excavations. The cross originally represented the earth, the great mother's body, her outstretched arms, the four directions. The swastika means the earth in flight. It is the cross with feet or wings set in motion. The earth and its moon are willed through their changes. Later seen as a sun wheel, the swastika was first a moon wheel and like the double crescent, the labrys. It could signify both directions of the cosmic spin into creation or dissolution. The right spinning wheel clockwise was used to build, encourage, maintain the left spinning wheel counter. The left spinning wheel counterclockwise was used to destroy, prevent, or transform the nature of something. Just so the witch circle turns clockwise to do, Wittershins to undo. The swastika can be found worldwide from old relics dug up in Iran to the pottery decorations of present-day Zuni Indians in the American Southwest. 
typically as on a 7th century BC terracotta amphora from Boeotia and other statues and pots from the Aegean, the swastika was associated with the Lady of the Beast, the New Stone Age version of the Paleolithic Mother of Wild Animals. It is one of the magic signs of the foot on the Buddha. Taken over by patriarchy, the swastika has meant only destruction. Hitler read it as an Aryan fire sign, an Aryan fire sign. The double axe or labrys was the instrument used by women in ceremony, agricultural work, and battle. It is an axe with two heads, the two moon crescents, waxing and wanning. A practical version was used by women in daily agricultural work. In the form of the battle axe, it was used by Amazonian warriors of North Africa, Thrace and Macedonia, and the Caucasus. As a sacred sacrificial axe, it could be used only by priestesses who alone could cut down the goddess's ceremonial trees. Our word labyrinth comes from the Minoan labyrinth. It refers to the Hall of Double Axis or labyrinth dug up by archaeologists at the Palace of Gnosis on Crete. Crete was the great matriarchal culture center of the Mediterranean. Its murals and mosaics, pottery designs, seals, and amulets show the labyrinth wielded only by women, and it appears extensively as an icon symbol of the great goddess. The bee was always a sign of the goddess. Honey was the only sweetener of the ancient world and its maker, the honeybee, is both industrious and magical. Only the female bees build hives and make honey. And they communicate with each other via dance language. Bees appear in the spring at the rebirth of grasses and flowers. The goddess was also pictured as chrysalis and butterfly, who emerges from its self-spun tomb, quote unquote, totally transformed. As the bird once emerged from the reptile and as the new soul, quote unquote, emerges from ritual death on wings of illumination. The butterfly is, like the cowrie shell, a bulbous symbol. According to Marija Gimbutas, the butterfly-winged goddess merged with the double axe image during the Bronze Age. The megalithic tomb was the body of the great mother. It was her temple where religious rites were performed at night by the light of her moon. The stoned minors were designated as females, colossal upright blocks, some 10 feet high and often grouped in threes. They embodied the triple goddess of birth, death, and rebirth and were associated throughout the Neolithic with vast circles marked out by stones which were ritual enclosures and sacred dance grounds. These stone circles or the traces of them are found worldwide. The rites enacted in the Menhir circles represented the spiritual understanding of the Neolithic people, their wish for union with the goddess and for immortality through her. The ceremonies were presided over by women shaman priestesses whose spheres were vision, sacrifice, poetic and magic lore, the ritual calendar and the law, and astronomical astrological observation. The later Druids inherited much of their knowledge, lore, and ritual. These priestesses were also healers, rainmakers, midwives, and keepers of Soma, the sacred mind-expanding drink. Beehive tombs with passage entranceways have been found from Greece to Ireland, dating from the close of 3000 BC, all have huge circular enclosures amphitheaters for funerary games, their entrances are ornamented with eight double spirals, the circle that has no end, the point that breathes itself into a universe and back again. On Crete, cult shrines enclosing small stone pillars or clay pillars molded around tree trunks were set up to ceremonialize the dead and the magic tomb. The Egyptian pyramids were an elaborate culmination of the megalithic tomb guarded by the giant Sphinx, who is the goddess guardian of the dead.
the earth mound as cosmic womb of the pregnant goddess. Silbury Hill, situated on the Wiltshire Downs in southwest England, is the largest surviving image of the goddess from Neolithic Europe. It is 520 feet in diameter and 130 feet high, and it is over 4,500 4, years old. For hundreds of years, male archaeologists have been excavating the mound, desperately hoping to find within it the Bronze Age burial remains of an ancient Essex king. But as Michael Dames points out in Salisbury Treasure, the great goddess rediscovered, Neolithic culture was based on kinship, not kingship. In Dames's view, the Silbury Mound expresses a vision of cosmic unity long lost to patriarchy. Silbury Hill was the primordial belly, the omphalos or navel of the world. The sacred mountain emerged from the waters of chaos. The world egg born from the primordial sea of night. It is the throne who is the squatting goddess, the white mountain, the navel of waters. The Indo-European he the Indo-European root for heel, kill, also meant a concealed or sacred place. Germanic haljo and was probably related to halig, meaning holy. The mountain was always a generator of energy, inspiring the high state of madness and prophecy, giving oracular powers. It is the world axis where the different levels of psychic or physical experience interpenetrate. The threshold between underworld, earth, and sky from which all creation emerges. From the mountain, the shaman begins her or his ecstatic journey. In Britain, there are 1,500 hilltops with large enclosures on their summits encircled by earthen banks. These earthworks look like coiled serpents and were used as ritual mazes. According to Michael Dames, Silberry Hill contains a vegetable core surrounded by layers of chalk, gravel, soil, and clay. Radiating from this core are spokes of twisted string looking like umbilical cords or snakes. This central axis is surrounded by sarsen stones, which are covered with earth dug, earth dug from the surrounding quarry, originally filled with water. The surface of the mother's body was water, and she contained within herself earth, water, air, and fire, or sunlight reflected in the moat. The hill and its ditch, a convex hill and concave hole, create together the image of the goddess squatting in the Neolithic birth position, tranquil and stable, ready to give birth to the world. The Neolithic farming communities had a non-linear sense of time, believing that time began anew with each new year. The pregnant mountain mother gave birth in August when the seeds spring planted in her womb had grown large. At that time, the entire community came to be with her. The divine birth is the harvest of the wheat and the first fruits were offered to the goddess. Similar mysteries were enacted in Eleusis around Demeter, the grain mother. In Britain, she was known as Bride, Anna, or Danu, and she was celebrated on her womb mounds in August as late as the 17th century AD. Great assemblies of witches traditionally gathered on Lamas Eve or August 1st. The people believing that their welfare in the coming year depended on the performance of these sacred rites of the corn mother or harvest queen. The Christian church throughout Britain finally took drastic action against the pagan cult worship. The Christian priesthood preaches linear, not cyclic time, hoping to separate man from the goddess of nature and God from the great cosmic rhythms of creation. As many wise people have observed, the way to control human life is to control the rhythm of life. Pagan life was ruled by natural cyclic rhythms. The church opposed these female rhythms with linear historic ones, thus trying to change human rhythm from natural to mechanical. 
which serves the industrial process but leaves human life and labor, including agricultural life and labor, quite alienated. As Dames says to both lunar and social phenomena, particularly the solstices and equinoxes, were studied by the late Neolithic fanning communities who also who used a solar calendar to determine annual agricultural events while the months from the word moon and the daily rhythms were linked to the more ancient lunar calendar in the ancient world the full moon was birth time for all life the ceremonial birth at silberry was celebrated on the night of the full moon closest to the fixed solar quarter day or sabbat of llamas Steelberry Hills drew up power or water from the underworld and drew down power or light from the sky. When these elements were joined within her body, the universal birth took place. The birth and death of light could be witnessed from her summit, both occurring at the same moment as the sun rose and the moon set. And after 12 hours, the reverse. All equal nostrils equinoctial settings of sun and full moon according to dames mark the positions of the goddess's moat eye at silberry the interaction between the hill mother and the river mother is one and bisexual the moon is born from the water and gives birth on the water the goddess at silberry is also the eye goddess as the moon and sunlight are reflected in the moat an image of the indivisibility of mind and matter, eye and womb, as well as their transformation through the tomb. When death was formed by the mother, everything was both dead and alive, in process by nature. Earth was seen in its totality and the people recognized death as one of the sources of first fruit ceremonies. This was the psychic orientation of pagan agriculturalists long before, in Dames's words, war was declared on the human body with the emergence of patriarchal warrior societies in the Bronze Age. This photo is the goddess at Karnak in Bretagne, 1980. Silberry Hill is comparable to the temples on Malta. To sleep within such a goddess shape would itself have been a ritual act. Recent excavations in the Orkney Islands of Scotland have revealed whole Neolithic villages, up to 60 houses designed in the shape of a goddess body. Individual houses made of stone and mud on a scar of bray are shaped like uteruses with vaginal entranceways. Stone temples in Malta are carved and built in the shape of the massive Paleolithic Great Mother and small clay figurines of the Great Goddess in this same form are found throughout Malta. The West Kennet Long Barrow in England is built in the same identical shape. The large Metamud Temple in Egypt and the Bryn Selidu Mound in Wales are the same body. The great earth mound belly open thighs of stone, the entrance portal open for the passage of birth and death. Worldwide, architecture was the mother of arts as women built to live within her body shape. Dogon villages in Africa are constructed in the shape of a bisexual human figure lying on its back. The village represents the first vibration of the cosmic egg. It is built in the center of fields cut in spirals. At the southern end is a cone-shaped shrine, the penis. A hallowed stone nearby on which the fruit is pressed for oil is the vagina. Menstrual huts to the east and west sides of the village are hands. Both sexes carry out the agricultural work of these bisexual villages. Primal people understand quite clearly that the shape of one's dwellings is the shape of one's life. Mm, interesting. The white goddess of pagan Britain was the mother of the good and fertile soil of the chalklands, white as the full moon. All her creation, including stones and men, animated. 
Her body permeated all the la the later Avebury monuments on the Wiltshire Downs. This area is rich in sarsen stones, massive blocks of hard sandstone, which lay on the surface of the hills and didn't need to be quarried. These stones were called bride stones. Bride or Bridget was one of the goddess's names. The white horse, a large turf cut figure on the hillside of Uffington in Berkshire is an evocation of Epona, the Celtic horse goddess. Dragon Hill nearby was a Neolithic first fruit ceremonial site. Folklore tells that the white sterile patch on its summit was caused by the execution of the life-giving dragon goddess at the hands of a patriarchal solar hero. Where her blood fell, nothing will grow. One such dragon slayer or serpent killing hero is St. Michael. Many of the earliest Christian churches in Britain dedicated to St. Michael were built precisely on the ancient mounds and high places of the great goddess. In Christian lore, St. Michael was the head chief of a band of angels, read, read, quote unquote, patriarchal invaders that went to war with the mother dragon and her people. In folklore, St. Michael is thought to be the successor of Wotan, the Anglo-Saxon god who was a warlike slayer of dragons. In fact, an abnormal number of Christian churches dedicated to St. Michael and St. George, the other British dragon slayer, are built on high places along the ley line or dragon path that runs from Land's End in Cornwall through the goddess monuments at Glastonbury and Avebury in southwest England. Such a St. Michael's church was built on the summit of Glastonbury Tor, but in the year 1300 AD, it was destroyed by an earthquake. As Elizabeth G. Davis notes, all the Christian male angels were originally the great goddess with her wings. When the image of the winged goddess continued to be engraved on Roman coins in defiance of the new Christian hierarchy in Constantinople, who had smashed or taken over all her Roman temples, the church fathers just changed her name to the angel of the Lord, Archangel, Archangel Michael. Glastonbury Tor is a spiral mound with a processional way along with a along which a dance was performed by the community circling around and up to the top. Glastonbury means glass castle, glass castles in Welsh, Irish, and Manx legend were island shrines or star prisons ruled by the white moon goddess of poetry and ritual death. In medieval legend, they were made of glass. In Neolithic times, they were goddess mounds of birth and death. Original rites at Glastonbury were aimed at restoring the bird and flower life of spring, perhaps. The mound was a magnetic center for the absorption and refraction of generative energies to which animal, bird, and plant life responded, and women as the ancient farmers and beekeepers performed the rites. Glastonbury was probably the enchanted Isle of Avalon, lands flowing with milk and honey, usually eulogized in the Bible as original Edens, were in fact the lands of the Neolithic goddess. Milk belongs to the mother, and since women were the first beekeepers, the honey has always symbolized matriarchy. North African and Thracian Amazons legendarily fed on honey and mare's milk, along with blood, raw meat, and reed marrow. The Indo-Europeans inherited beekeeping from the Minoans of Crete, who practiced it from the beginning of the Neolithic. Cretans believed that at the death of the sacrificial bull, the goddess was reborn as a bee. Thus, the bull-born goddess of transformation and regeneration. Both bee and bull belonged to the moon. The bull, because of its crescent horns, while the bees make the sweet light of honey within the, within the night darkness of the hive. At Ephesus, where the many-breasted Artemis Diana was worshipped, the bee 
appeared as her cult animal. Her temple at Ephesus was a symbolic beehive built by priestesses and known as one of the wonders of the ancient world. Her priestesses were called Melissal or bees, and the eunuch priests were Essenes or drones. Thus, the beehive shape of so many Neolithic earth mounds was quite intentional and symbolic. Beekeeping was a metaphor for settled agriculture and for the peaceful abundance of the earth in those times. And the honeybee was like the full moon making illumination in the night. In Ireland, in Brittany and Wales, and in Scandinavia, the fairies with their fairy queen are still believed to be living in earth mounds or tomb dwellings. The Swedish sagas about trolls are obviously distorted tales about ancient moon worshiping people. The trolls are said to live inside mountains, to be dressed in skins, to eat human flesh, to exist in both human and animal form, and to die if caught in the rays of the sun. They live by night, by moonshine. So in Ireland, the fairy people said to live inside the burial mounds are Tuatha de Danann, people of the goddess Danu, displaced and driven underground by later patriarchal invaders. The Danans were matrilinear and their goddess was the mother of all magic, art, and craft. Halloween was originally Samhain, one of the four great cross quarter days or Sabbaths of the witch year in pagan Britain. Originally on this night of all souls, priestess oracles sat on the stone portals of earth mounds or mass burial chambers, while the spirits of the heroic dead passed in and out, visiting the world just once before the great death of winter. In North America, Neolithic farming cultures also built earth mounds. The earliest dating from 1000 BC were found throughout the Southeast by early explorers. From Florida and Georgia into West Virginia, Kentucky, and the Tennessee Valley, and West into Arkansas and Oklahoma. Ohio was the site of two great mound building Native American cultures, the Adena, dating circa 800 BC to AD 900 built conical mounds, the Hopewell 600 BC to AD 1500, elaborated on the earlier structures, building huge mounds and earthen embankments covering hundreds of acres. Both these cultures built burial mounds. Later people in the Southeast built temple mounds, large earthworks with temples on the top, but no burial chambers within. Ohio is the site of the Great Serpent Mound of the Adena culture. The Serpent Mound is 1,400 feet long, made of earth in the shape of a snake winding around the cosmic egg, the maternal ovum. Many American Indian cultures were not mound builders, but be most believed their ancestors emerged from such mounds or from some such structure symbolizing the earth's pregnant belly. The Hopi and other Southwest tribes still go into kivas or underground chambers for initiation into the presence of the earth spirit. And the great pyramids of Mexico and Central America were built up generation after generation over original earth mound structures. Mexico means navel of the moon. The islands of Malta and Gozo. On the islands of Malta and Gozo in the Mediterranean can be seen the clearest connection between the cave, the tomb, and the temple, all three being the body of the Great Mother. Sometime in the third or second millennium BC, or maybe earlier, an incredibly advanced culture developed on these small and isolated islands, which situated between Sicily and the Libyan coast were really right at the center of the ancient world. Malta and Gozo were an ancient sacred center for the religion of the great mother. From Europe, from Africa, from the Aegean and the Near East, pilgrims traveled here and the sick came to be healed. 
over a period of perhaps 1,000 years, up to 30 huge megalithic temple structures were built on these islands. But there are no remains of houses, only the caves show any trace of habitation. The amazing architecture of these temples was far beyond its time. Pottery and carvings are found in the ruins, but there is a complete absence of metal, the only tools being rough stone implements and the horns of oxen and goats. Perhaps there was a religious taboo on the use of metal. No weapons were made or used on the islands. Metallurgy began, in fact, as a sacred technology of the goddess. Only ceremonial metals were cast at first. There was much taboo around the use of metals and no doubt secrecy about smelting methods. Pagan European witches and Native Americans share an ancient belief that metal interferes with magic. These were stone-oriented people who felt metals blocking and distorting psychic spiritual energy currents. Witches were not supposed to touch iron. Guy Underwood, a British water diviner, says his experiences have shown him that placing a metal object on a blind spring obliterates for a short time all geodetic reactions around it. Water is extremely sensitive to metals, especially heavy metals. The Malta and Gozo temples imitated the rock-cut megalithic tombs of the mainland. They were built in roundish chambers in cloverleaf and crescent designs around an inner courtyard with long connecting courtyards between them. No dead were buried in these temples. Bodies were still entered in caves and rock-cut tombs. But there was only a step from performing ceremonial rites at the cave tombs to building special temples for the veneration of the spirits of the dead. The temples were built with enormous double walls, rubble, and earth piled in the space between the inner and outer wall. So in effect, the temple was still inside the earth as inside a mountain, surrounded by powerful earth currents, similar to a ratian organ chamber, in fact. In myth, Gozo was the island realm of Calypso, the daughter of Uranus. It was on Gozo that the patriarchal hero Ulysses was believed to have stayed, enchanted by the sorceress Calypso for seven years. In myth, the huge temple of Gantesia, or Gantia, 4th millennium BC, was built by a giant titan woman with a baby at her breast. Single-handedly in one day, she hauled the huge blocks of stone to the building site and built the temple walls by night. This temple is 90 feet high and some of its great stone slabs measure five yards by four yards. Mortar was used on the inside walls, which were then painted with red ochre, the color of rebirth. Some of the megaliths weighed 50 tons and stone rollers that must have been used to transport the huge blocks have been found by the temple site. The entire, the entire population of the island must have worked during many generations to produce this single temple. What were they seeking? Probably what we, would, we could call the living darkness. The stillness of the tomb, the breathing silence of the womb of the, of the earth mother. The chambers painted blood red had no sharp angles. All the shapes are rounded or molded in curves and waves. There was no worship of the heavens in these temples and no human sacrifice. There are traces only of animal sacrifice and the pouring of libations. Here, the living and the dead were as close as possible to each other. Shaman priestess sleeping within New Grange, listening to the voices of the underworld. Shoe 1981. But the strangest thing is that the temple on the surface of the earth was only the entrance to a still vaster shrine beneath. 
Legends tell of a huge labyrinth, catacomb, or rock necropolis built under the temple, a quote-unquote city of the dead in which the whole island population ultimately resided. In fact, an enormous labyrinthine cave sanctuary has been found, the collective burial tomb of 7,000 bodies. This mass tomb was built in several stories out of the subterranean rock. At its entrance is a trilithian is a trilithian gateway giving access to the underground city, the abode of the quote unquote the perfect ones. Long valued corridors or blood stained with red ochre led to a sacred deep temple area with its altar pillars gateway and spiral designs painted in red on the roof it mirrored or echoed the temple built above ground this was the center of something as malta and gozo are indeed at the geographic center of the neolithic great goddess culture stretching from africa to scandinavia from sumeria to spain or to the sunken continent of Atlantis, as some believe. In this sacred space, priestesses of the great goddess contacted the spirits of the dead, consulted oracles, prophesied, and performed ritual healing. In the temple are huge squatting images of the goddess. These are the same bulging rounded shape as the temple. In later images, she wears a flounced skirt with small figures hiding in it for protection. She holds her arm raised to her breast. Her head is smaller proportionately than the body and made of a separate material. And she wears a blissful expression, peaceful, gracious, and still. She meditates with closed eyes sitting on a throne and she has small, delicate hands. The blood of sacrificed animals was poured into a stone vessel with a hollow base standing on the altar and burning fire ceremonies were also enacted. These secret chambers of the Great Mother where timeless mysteries were performed are guarded by her eyes, the cosmic symbol of the double spiral inscribed on the ceiling stone. Plant, flower, and animal motifs are carved in relief on the walls and altars, and they show strong Cretan influence, evidence of much contact between these islands. The temples were also healing centers. The sick came to sleep in the huge stone chambers. Priestesses in clairvoyant sleep listened to the voices of the underworld. Divination and also acoustic conjuring were practices. Were practiced. The priestesses moldings seeming the voice of earth itself. People came on pilgrimage to sleep in the temple to have dream communion with the powers of the underworld and the dead to obtain counsel, wisdom, healing, and clairvoyant knowledge of the future. The temples contain two small figurines of sleeping women sleeping to dream, to die, to wait for birth and rebirth. They echo the huge pregnant shape of her who was both impersonal and kind, both familiar and terrible. The earth embodying cosmic strength, mystery, abundance, paradox. We don't know anything about the people who built these island temples. They were weaponless and so defenseless against warlike pirates who overran them using metal weapons. These conquerors probably came by way of Sicily, bringing a culture much inferior to that of Malta. They still practiced some form of goddess worship, but they burned their dead, showing that they were in transition from matriarchal to patriarchal orientation, since the Sky Father worshiping nomads from the East also practiced cremation. They sent the body spirit up to the sky rather than returning it to the earth womb. It is quite possible that Malta and Gozo were schools for priestesses. Such island schools are common in legend. Ancient Celtic myth tells of sacred islands inhabited and ruled by women where the mysteries were kept and taught. According to Irish text, the Tuatha de Dan came from such an island in the north where they had learned science, magic, art, 
and ancient wisdom from priestesses of the goddess Danu. Druids were buried in ceremonial groves on distant islands. According to the Roman Pomp Pomponus Mila, facing the Celtic coast lie a group of islands which take the collective name of Cassiterites. Cena off the Breton coast was renowned for its Gallic oracle whose priestesses, sacred for their everlasting virginity, were said to be nine in number. These priestesses were called Gal Galicians and had magic powers. To unleash the winds and storms by their spells, to metamorphs any animal according to their whim, to cure all disease said to be incurable, and finally, to know and predict the future. But they reserved their remedies and predictions exclusively to those who traveled over the sea expressly to consult them. They were nine in number because nine is the triplicity of three, the sacred number of the moon goddess. Girls who were to become priestesses were chosen at the age of nine. Nine priestesses are pictured dancing around an ithyphallic young man in a cave painting at Kogel in northeastern Spain, dating from the old Stone Age Aragnatian period. Arranged in a crescent, the dancing nine represent the moon's phases, growing older in a clockwise direction, three young girls, three strong grown women, three thin dark crones. The oldest with an old moon face dances widdershins counterclockwise. This painting could be 30,000 years old, so primordial is witchcraft. On the, sec on the sacred island of Avalon, Apple Island, Morgan Le Fay, the quote-unquote fairy, ruled over nine sisters and taught how plants can be used to cure illness. She knew the art of changing her outward form and could fly through the air with the aid of magic feathers. She was one of many renowned shamans practicing ancient women's wisdom on an enchanted island. The temples of Malta and Gozo reveal that such legends were based on reality as legends usually are. All that remains of the Maltese island people are their resonant stone temples, but their religious ideas and rites were similar to those surviving in the mystery cults of classical Greece. Such survivals showed that early Christianity's belief in the body's immortality grew from very deep and ancient pre-Indo-European patriarch, pre-patriarchal roots. Delphi was another oracular shrine tomb. Located on the Greek mainland, it was ruled over by a spiraling python serpent and a prophetic priestess who served Gaia, the earth death mother. The python was housed in the Ampolis or navel shrine, the navel of the earth, built underground in beehive shape, originally perhaps deriving from the African Masabo or ghost house. The name Delphi comes from Delphine, the great snake of the mother. The goddess's most ancient name at Malta had been Delphine since she was part serpent. And the name comes from an ancient word, Delphis, meaning womb, and is now the brand name of a contraceptive foam. <laughs> Apollo, the patriarchal sun god of classic Greece, was a mythological latecomer to the oracular shrine at Delphi, though now he is always associated with it. Apollo began as an underground oracular hero, in fact, and his name means Apple Man. In classic myth, he could not rule at Delphi until he had slain the sacred python with his arrows or phallic sunbeams, as Zeus had also killed the dragon offspring of the earth goddess at Dodona. But even after the slaying of the symbolic python, the prophetic sibyl, at Apollo's Delphi remained a woman. Bending over her tripod, inhaling smoke and entering trance, she pronounced her judgments on past, present, and future acts of the Greeks. 
but Apollo as harbinger of patriarchal sun god technology increased the production demand on the Oracle beyond her endurance and human capacity, driving her mad. As John Mitchell has noted, the same policy of artificially inducing and mechanically increasing the Earth's fertility attempting to mass produce earth's fruits for profit rather than accepting what is given organically by nature can be found wherever the solar gods assumed management over the ancient shrines of the goddess. Blood was used in the Delph Delphic shrine to feed the ghost and make them return to speak and prophesy through the Sibyl. The Sibyl drank the blood producing in herself prophetic ecstasy. Sounds of peepings and mutterings and eerie bat-like voices speaking through her were believed to be the voices of ghosts. This was the function of ancient human and animal sacrifice. The recently dead were more easily recalled from the other world and not so potentially dangerous as those long dead. Through these dead confidants, the priestess gained knowledge of healing and the future. The bull with its lunar horns was associated with the underground rituals. Bull's blood was believed to be the most potent magic and diluted with water, it was used to fertilize the fields and orchards of Crete and Greece. Drunk straight, it was considered a deadly poison to anyone but the Sibyl or priestess of the goddess. Archaically, bull sacrifice took place in a ritual circle of 12 stone herms or pillars at the foot of a sacred hill. Half the bull's blood was sprinkled on a 13th herm in the circle center. The rest was poured into a large basin from which the priestess drank. The Celts also used bull's blood for the divination. Irish poets had to drink bull's blood and then lie down to dream in order to tell the truth. Twelve circling dancers. Again and again in the, re in the religion of the great mother, one comes across twelve dancers in a circle. Even the passion that I revealed to the to thee and the others in the round dance, I would have it called a mystery. These are supposedly the original words of Christ leading the 12 apostles in a hymn to the biblical father. And the following comes from the Gnostic round dance taken from the apoc apocryphal acts of St. John. And we all circled round him or her and responded to him or her, amen. The twelfth of the numbers paces the round aloft, amen. To each and all it is it is given to dance, amen. Both the dance and the number twelve are taken from the original goddess religion, the old religion as witches and pagans would say. Everything alive in Christianity, especially in heresies, is taken from the old religion. Within the witches' covens, there are 12 members and a high priestess. Women and men in alternating positions dance around the magic circle that has been drawn on the ground or floor and blessed by the high priestess. The witches take their sacrament and jump over the holy fire to stimulate the life-giving energies of the moon. The witches or Wiccan wise ones practice an ancient women's religion, the Dianic cult, whose rites and beliefs were passed down directly from the earliest Paleolithic and Neolithic religions. It has apparently been determined that the secret language used now in the covens is Neolithic Basque. Very interesting since Basque is believed to be a remnant of the language used in Atlantis. During the Christian, the Christian Inquisition and witch hunts, which went on for over five centuries, the Wiccan chose hideous torture and death at the stake rather than forego their ancient ways inherited from the beginnings of things. They believed that the fertility of the countryside and the health of the people, quote unquote, pagan means, quote unquote, peasant, depended upon the performance of their sacred rites. They also knew they were involved with the ir irreducible truth, the unimprovable original. 
In a Neolithic cave located in Sacro Monte, Spain, 13 skeletons all in priestess dress and holding amulet bundles were found. They sat in a circle and apparently had participated in a ritual death. The floor was strewn with beads and seeds of the opium poppy. The high priestess wore a leather tunic engraved with geometric symbols. We don't know why they chose to die in this cavern north of Granada, but they were sister members of the world's oldest religion. On Crete, the sacred ring dances were performed. Naked women dancers, armed linked, circled within an area enclosed by the sacred horns of consecration. Perhaps they danced to raise the Kundalini powers, the collective free flow of their mental, biological, and spiritual energies directed at a common task or vision. The dance is a recreation of the goddess's original cosmic dance of creation, clockwise and dissolution, counterclockwise. We don't know what kind of power was generated by these dances, but we can guess. Some other form of energy, real technological power, can be produced by tapping the terrestrial and cosmic energy currents and consciously directing their flow. When the psychic powers, body, mind, and spirit are correctly concentrated, magical results are possible. All existence is the result of vibrations of the elements. All matter consists of cosmic light and sound waves vibrating at different speeds control the elements. I'm sorry, vibrating at different speeds, the pure sound of the element in the elemental composition. Sufis believe that by sound, one is able to affect and perhaps control the elements. All matter consists of cosmic light and sound weight. I'm sorry. Elizabeth Gold Davis suggests that the ancient women shamans were able to control by group sound the elemental vibrations with very practical results. Indeed, legends from the Near East, Europe, and Britain tell of great stones being raised, huge megalithic structures built by magic use of sound alone. In one legend, large stones are set floating in the air by women playing sacred pipes. Rocking stones poised in such a way that they moved at a touch, perfectly balanced, were used for divination and magic. Oracles always women were inspired by the sound of the stones rocking and the energy it generated. Such rocking stones can still be found throughout the countryside of Britain and the Britain, Britain coast of France. How were those cyclopean walls of Jericho and Malta built? Remember the builders used no metal tools. Remember the recurring images of the goddess, her priestesses and dancers with upraised arms. Perhaps this was the posture of the cosmic moment when the goddess appeared, the moment of simultaneous time slash non-time when galactic and earth forces fuse and flow together, directed by the human spirit. Women in a dance circle with upraised arms are pictured in Stone Age cave and cliff paintings throughout Europe and Africa, the first homes of humanity. Millennia later in patriarchal legend, Moses with supported upraised arms helped bring victory to the Hebrews. This iconic posture of a power figure with raised arms supported by the people goes back to the first human experiences of the goddess. And the concept is always related to the fusion of material and spiritual energies in a changed or magic body. The goddess with upraised arms and parted legs gave birth to the universe and the world. Ancient images also show her as magic musician blowing sacred pipes or conch shells. In the, Taz in the Tanzanian cliff paintings found by Mary Leakey, some estimated to be 20, 29,000 years old, all the groups are dancing women, some carrying musical instruments. A tall, wonderful red ochre piper plays with dashed lines falling from the end of her pipe. A singer's open mouth has the same lines falling from it. These lines are song and could also be rain. 
A South African Bushman painting shows a naked woman in the sky with magic rain making lines coming from her body and the rain falling on a reclining woman and a man standing with upraised arms. Ancient rainmaking was a woman's activity or rain was seen to fall from a woman's body or the moon. As the possessor of the secret of life, woman's music, dancing, and utterance had magic and binding significance, helping to release the life forces not into chaos but into harmonious activity. Women in their dances imitated the animals, especially birds and snakes, and resonated with natural energies of earth and weather. In women's art and pottery design, also connections were made between meanders, rhythm, music, and dance, rippling waters, the motions of snakes and water birds. In this way, women originated dance, music, art, and ritual as a magic as a magic linking of physical and symbolic forces. Young women of the Babinda tribe in South Africa identify with the serpent force. Older female initiators kneel in the center as pivots around which the young dancers spiral in the rhythmic coils and undulations of the python. Collapsing and reviving, they rest around with they rest like the forces of nature in the seasonal round of death and rebirth. Dahomey and priestesses in West Coast Africa still perform a very similar python dance as an energy razor and communication with departed spirits. These women are invoking more than personal fertility. Their dances are ritual linkings relegated to bind of the individual and tribal energies with the entire musical pulse of the earth and with the dance cycle of cosmic energies. This primordial and continuous linking or symbolic binding always took place within through by means of the female body. The health, well-being, and experienced ecstasy of a people depended on the health, well-being, and experienced ecstasy of this female body, of individual women, of Mother Earth, of the cosmic dancing woman. Sufi dervishes claim that their hand clapping, dancing, whirling, and singing are involuntary expressions of the divine power manifesting itself through their bodies. They say this is a way of life handed down from remotest antiquity. This training in ecstasy was designed to produce the perfect woman or man within this world, not out of it. Sufi dancing is a vehicle for self-realization, an experience of the self's joyous union with the larger self of the universe. The dervishes developed their ecstatic rites against the background of a moralistically strict and misogynistic Islam. Were they reconnecting in a patriarchal milieu with ancient matriarchal rites of ecstatic women shamans? Their teaching is based on the concept of essence. She or he who knows her or his essential self knows God. The dervish is called knower, lover, follower, traveler. Dervish itself means poor man or waiting at the doors of enlightenment. Are Sufis the inheritors of some of the rites of the ancient great goddess? They are, even as the Essenes were or originally ecstatic worshipers in the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. The Sufi ceremonial axe is an Amazonian labris. Labrys, a bronze double crescent of the goddess, direct descendant of the double axis used by the priestesses on matriarchal Crete. In Sufi belief, there is a form of superior mental activity available to human beings and its power can be manifested on the plane of daily life. But most people cannot open to this mental power because our psychic energies are blocked by rigid, conventional, and dualistic thought habits. This superconsciousness includes precognition, telepathy, and bilocation, the ability to exist in two places at once. 
Sufis encourage poetic thinking and language and specialize in making startling and cryptic utterances. This has given them a reputation as socially unrealistic and even mad. In fact, they are female. They teach techniques to help free the mind from cultural preconceptions and conditioned ideas. And their methods are not linear and verbal, but multi-sensory using auditory, tactile, kinetic sense impacts, as well as visual. Sufis believe that their teachings constitute the inner reality of all religions, the core truths and techniques of all human spiritual psychic experience. And so it seems to be elements of their teaching can be found in the early Trabador culture of Europe in the witch cults and mystic rites of the Knights Templar in alchemic and Gnostic ideas, like in all those pagan European remnants of the great goddess worship, which the Christian church worked for so many centuries to destroy. Many of the same core techniques are found among Native Americans, Siberian shamanic cultures, Haitian Vodun cults, and what remains of African magic religion, especially among the Dahomey and other West Coast African goddess people. As Sufis believe in communication without physical presence, they could be spread out everywhere. Wandering musical Sufi jesters and Ariakins, Arakins, Ariakins, or Harlequins in patchwork costumes traveling on foot from city to city, teaching by songs and cryptic words, sometimes not speaking at all. No matter how much physical distance separates them, all Sufis feel themselves linked by a force they call Baraka, meaning grace, lightness, and beauty. In their ecstatic dance rites, Sufi der dervishes go into swoons. They sing, sigh, weep, cry, sway from side to side, thrust knives into their flesh, burn themselves in the heat of delirious passion. In the mystic spiral, Jill Purse describes a dervish dancing in following robes, in flowing robes. The dervish starts his dance with his arms crossed over his breast, suggesting a junction in the heart of the descending and ascending vortices, the ancient attitude posture of the goddess. He has his left foot firmly earthed, representing the steel axis. By moving his right foot, he begins like a planet to turn on his own axis while revolving with his fellows around a central sun, the leading dervish. He gradually expands, uncrosses his arms, and lowering his head over his right shoulder, he raises his arm, his right arm, of and in consciousness to receive the divine emanation, and lowers his left to return his gift to the earth. He spins gradually faster as if by his own revolutions, he were connecting heaven and earth by actually turning the spirit through himself and down in the ground while his axis and heart remain absolutely still and his own spirit soars to its divine source. The greater his ecstasy, his expansion and speed, the wider his skirt extends. When his arms are both outstretched to heaven, it is as if the union in his heart delineated in its state of contraction, spirit into matter by his crossed arms, has reached its fullest expression, matter into spirit, by the opposing gyres or gyres, whatever, of arms and skirt. The outer expression of the bliss of the divine union in the very stillness of his heart. If at one point in this dance with right arm pointing to sky and the left to earth, the dervish seems very much like the magician in the tarot cards. It is because they come from the same place and have the same meaning. The Paleolithic male shaman in animal skins and mask stood in the same posture, holding up the quote unquote lunar baton of commandment borrowed from women's mysteries to be his androgynous ensign of power. Hmm. 
The magician's baton, misnamed by a male archaeologist, was a woman's was women's lunar calendar stick, the first time measuring device known, dating from the Ice Age. A male magician or shaman cannot be magic or female without it. Other forms of ecstatic dancing come down to us from the Near East. Thrace, the Mediterranean, preserved in Greek legend. One of these is the ecstatic dance of the Bacantes, the Bacantes. Wild women intoxicated by chewing ivy leaves and also the mushroom sacred to Dionysus. The Bacantes or Thracian maenads, mad women, were the daughters of the great mother, her quote unquote, white wild maids, possessing the magical power to make the whole earth blossom. Rites were performed on mountaintops and at the touch of these wild women's wands, the original lunar calendar stick, streams of wine and water, milk and honey, broke free and flowed from the rocks. In their ivy-induced fury at the dark of the moon, they would tear any man in pieces who happened to cross their path or entered their sacred precincts. Dionysus himself, who some would call basely effeminate, was torn apart ritually and eaten as a sacrament. This story could apply to the magic mushroom itself, which was called Dionysus. The cult of Dionysus and the wild women was popular with the common people, especially those in the countryside, the countryside far into Roman times. Central to this cult were the ancient mushroom mysteries, the communal eating of hallucinogenic psilocybin called the body of Dionysus. The spotted scarlet flycap, Amanita muscaria, was referred to as Christ's body by Hebrew and early Christian cultists. There is no doubt that all ancient religious experience was associated with if it did not originate in hallucin hallucinogenic experience and that this was under the tutelage of women, the great stone age pharmacologists. Anthropologist Jaquetta Hawks also believes that the ecstatic mystery religion of Dionysus, the tender faced and curly haired son of the Cretan great mother, was originally the cult of the great goddess herself and her wild orgiastic women. When we think of the love and death goddess Dionysus surrounded by white, wild, mad women, our minds fly back immediately to that old Stone Age cave in northeast Spain with the hugely gentle young man surrounded by a crescent of nine moon phase women all dancing. This was the young man who became the Neolithic son slash lover of the goddess and eventually Christ. In Cretan myth, Dionysus was the bisexual son of the mother raised as a girl among women. Throughout the Near East and the Aegean, he was known by many names. Addis, Adonis, Tammuz, Demuzi, Osiris. Jesus was called Adonai or Lord after his erotic prototype, Adonis. As a vegetation god, he was ritually sacrificed using, sorry, usually on a tree, prototype of the later crucifix. His flesh was eaten as bread, his blood drunk as wine. Dionysus is the god of the vine, wine, and divine intoxication. This ritual sacrifice in the harvest season was believed to be necessary for the land's fertility. The immortal son's mortal part, his flesh and blood energies, were cut up and sprinkled on the fields. The Christ idea was in no way birth, death, rebirth, ritual cosmology. I'm sorry. The Christ idea was in no way, yeah, original with the Hebrews of Bible times, but inherited by them, along with paradise garden myths, flood myths, and an entire birth, death, rebirth ritual cosmology from the entire Neolithic agricultural great goddess religion of the Near East. They added to all this just one new twist, the incorporation of the mother's son into a strictly patriarchal ontology.
Soto Women's Music, it's June 1975. In From Ritual to Romance, English scholar Jesse Weston traced the red thread from these Neolithic mother goddess and son lover sacrifice god mystery cults into early Christian mysticism and all also into pagan European legends of the grail, the sacred quest and the healing of the wasteland, which became merged with Christian romance. 20th century poets like T.S. Eliot drew heavily on her discoveries and ideas without giving her much credit, but turned the spirit quest into one of patriarchal Christian despair and resignation rather than a courageous and ecstatic return and reintegration with the goddess. Poetry was originally oral, the chant of ecstatic dance and entranced prophecy. Long before the Song of Songs, Near Eastern erotic poetry was the expression of the love cycle of Inanna and Demuzi. Ishtar and Tammuz, the goddess and her son slash lover. The Song of Songs itself is clearly a pre-patriarchal chant of ecstasy to the black goddess. Among the North African Berbers and other pre-Islamic Moorish peoples in the region that is now Morocco and Algeria, it was the women who traditionally made, chanted, and sang the lyric love poetry. This tradition was undoubtedly once spread throughout Western and Northern Africa. According to Brifault in his fascinating book, Trobadors, these Moorish women's song forms and erotic love poetries were carried by the Moors into Spain and the French provincial region and were the seeds of the Trobador tradition that flourished in the Middle Ages. This tradition became European lyric poetry. And with that, we are going to end. Uh, thank you all again for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um, you can donate, cash app, PayPal. It's scrolling across the screen or in the description. If you would like to purchase this book, the link is also in the description. You can check out earlier videos on YouTube, Facebook, um, Twitter, or wherever I have them at. Uh, stay tuned for the upcoming radio show, Hebrew Truth Music Network. Again, thank you all for listening. Have a wonderful, wonderful, blessed day. May the Most High and the Earth Mother continue to bring you wonderful, wonderful blessings of abundance, health, healing. Uh, shalom.